Welcome to the 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff we discuss here is not easily found anywhere else. The Indian Air Force has quite a large variety of combat planes and service at the moment of recording this video. It has 54 MiG-21, 118 Sepikat Jaguar, 65 MiG-29, 45 Mirage 2000, 261 Sukhoi Su-30 MKI, 18 Hal Tejas, and 5 Rafals. There are 36 in all. That makes seven distinct combat models of Russian, French, or local origin. There are also more than 80 combat planes on order, again of various models. The Saudi Air Force, a little populated but rich country, has the following. 62 F-15, 136 F-15E Strike Eagle, 72 Eurofighter Typhoon, and 81 Panavia Tornado, four different models of European and American origin. The Qatar Air Force, an even smaller country, deploys the following. Nine Mirage 2000, 24 Dassault Rafale with 12 more on order, 36 F-15E on order, 24 Eurofighter Typhoon again on order. Less than 100 combat planes split along for models of French and American origin. These are only a few examples, but there are many others, for example, Korea, Japan, and so on. If we compare these air forces with traditional Western air forces, yes, we see a difference. France, Rafale and Mirage 2000, progressively retiring. Royal Air Force, Typhoon and F-35. German Air Force, Typhoon and Tornado, Italian Air Force, Typhoon, Tornado, AMX and F-35, but AMX and Tornado are being retired as well. Even the Chinese and Russian Air Forces are very differentiated too, and comparatively way more differentiated than the United States Air Force. So it seems immediately clear that some Air Forces, even the relatively small ones, do not refrain from variety, while traditional Western Air Forces do. Actually, we would expect the opposite because we all know a large variety has larger cost as well. And you would expect that only traditional Air Forces in rich developed countries can afford it. So there is this assumption that is commonly accepted that a limited number of platforms is better for logistics and since most of modern combat aircraft are multi-role platforms, eventually a single model could cover all the combat missions for an air force. In fact, many minor air forces do follow exactly this approach. They are single model air. However, let's unpack this idea that logistics is more complicated and expensive if there are many different models in service. Modern combat planes are very complicated. Even the simplest among them is an order of magnitude more complex of World War II plane, or even anything designed in the early 50s. The complexity started being a real factor in the 60s when electronics became essential to accomplish the mission. The flip side of this complexity is that about 20% of the force is not available at any given time for repairs or for maintenance. And actually, 20% is an excellent percentage, to be honest. An Air Force left with insufficient maintenance is going to lose its effectiveness very, very quickly. So it would seem just natural that if there was a single model in service, there would be no differentiation for the spares. They would be procured in bulk, better prices due to the economy of scale. Also, if all the air bases and all the warehouses stock the same spares, they could exchange them in case of need. This would indeed be true if the model used for the maintenance would be as just described. In reality, there are different levels of maintenance. Some of it, the simplest is executed at the air bases by the Air Force personnel. More complex interventions or repairs, though, are often executed by the manufacturer. 
in the factory or by a maintenance facility located where the planes can freely fly to. Uh, these factory-based operations are way less sensitive to the scale economies that just bring spares, being the resource consumption salaries the most expensive element. Training is perhaps the most crucial element to maintain an Air Force operation. Training doesn't involve pilots only, but also the large number of ground specialists and all the ground personnel necessary to keep the organization going. The line of flight manager to the cooks. A variety of models means that there need to be dedicated training facilities for each model. Uh, training the aircraft, the place usually, but also simulators, uh, technical schools and so on. And the trainers too need a specific experience on that specific model that they're teaching about. So obviously having everything duplicated is more expensive. Unless you do the bulk of your training abroad. This is not the case for the Indian Air Force that we mentioned before, but many Gulf states, for example, make large use of foreign training facilities. In this case, the cost is for the trained pilot or for the trained specialist, rather than for maintaining the infrastructure and the organization. An additional complexity connected with the variety is that multiple supply chains are required. The supply chain is the complex of people, companies, and general organizations required to keep the planes operational. We are talking the manufacturer, its suppliers, and the suppliers of its suppliers, and so on. Having multiple supply chains completely separate places an extra burden onto the Air Force organization. And the Air Force itself is a less relevant client for a large organization. But on the flip side, it is also useful for the Air Force not to rely on a single source and put all the eggs into one big basket. Where the complexity becomes really relevant is with the weapons. Different design schools use different weapons, so different weapons need to be provisioned. Let's keep considering the Indian Air Force. It has a mix of French and Russian designs. The family of weapons these planes use in their original version could not be more different. In India, large work has been done around weapons integration. For example, the Sukhoi 30 and KI, other than the usual family of Russian weapons, it can also use the Darter, the local Astra, and the integration has been tested with the Mika. All these integrations are extremely expensive and require time and expertise and resources and ultimately money. Basically, the plane needs to be modified to use the weapon. Often this modification is mostly at software level, but in some cases new pylons or new interfaces and new electronics need to be developed. This is an area where have planes all of the same family drastically brings costs down. And obviously, all this does not only apply to the weapons, but also to the communication systems, the data links, and all the various pods uh, for targeting or reconnaissance that an aircraft may need to uh, execute its mission. So to wrap it up, it is true, variety implies higher cost, even if there are some mitigating factors, as we have explained. But there is one huge advantage in variety, that is hardly spoken of. The Indian Air Force, which is paradigmatic in this respect, has seven frontline combat models. There are obviously overlaps among their missions. 230 MKI and Rafale are true modern multi role. MiG-29 and MiG-2000 have air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capabilities, albeit to a lesser extent than the two before. The MiG-21 is basically an interceptor with limited air-to-ground capabilities. The Tejas is a light multi-role, good to complement the other models. And the Jaguar is an old but still effective ground attack play. It may seem that all these overlaps are a waste of money and an unnecessary complexity but with complexity come options. The Indian Air Force, for example, can execute the same mission with different planes and different weapons. The Indian planners have the possibility to hit the same target in various different ways. Not all the options are equally modern, they're not equally sophisticated or effective, but the opponent 
doesn't know on this in principle what is going to happen. This is a huge advantage. Surprise is the most important force multiplier in war. And surprise can be generated through incertitude. The defender has to consider different options. It might spread itself too thick and leave gaps, thereby being unprepared to counter the mass. And the same may be true for an intruder in the Indian airspace. It might be confronted by the Rafale with the long-range meteors, or by fast and nimble MiG-21 acting as interceptors, or by Mirage 2000 operating at medium or close range. It is not easy being ready for everything. There is also another advantage in variety. A mix of different models is more resilient against countermeasures. Let us suppose that the opponent finds a very effective way to jam the MiG-21 brake. The same jammer may be not equally effective against the other models that can keep operating in the same role while the MiG-21 is moved to another mission or to a different area. This is not the case for electronics only. The tactics that turn out to be effective against a model can be ineffective against or even harmful against another. Uh, this is the nature of war. An action will cause a reaction, and over time, what used to be effective may be countered. There may be new tactics that in turn will cause changes and so on. Going through this process for certain different types of planes and many more weapons is clearly more difficult than doing the same for one model a few weapons. A very complex air force like the Indian can be neutralized only but neutralizing each different model. If there are many models, it is much more difficult to neutralize all of them. So if this is the case, we still have a question to answer. Why Western Air Forces tend to uniformity them? Well, I suspect this is me speculating that there are two different forces at work here. The first is the economic and managerial culture that imbues all the West. In the world of management, reducing costs almost always has a positive spin. And this managerial culture is taught to officers and decision makers in the military as well. So I suspect that a disproportionate attention is placed on the efficiency per unit of money spent. The second element is the complacency that Western military organizations have matured almost unconsciously from the fact that they never had to fight a peer adversary since World War II. Deep in their mind, they are convinced to be the best and that they will always ultimately prevail. I personally and humbly, I consider this a very dangerous line of thought. So if you like this video, I'm sure you will like the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, please like, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing and you will have my gratitude forever. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching and see you in the next video.